Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, and it's time for episode 5 of me playing Mirror's Edge. One of my favourite underrated gems, and a flawed masterpiece, which I think I've already said. So before we jump in, I just want to highlight a couple things that I think I've forgotten to say in videos so far. Um, this is all announced via text and stuff, so go follow me on Twitter or on Tumblr or whatever. Uh, but just in case, here I am also announcing it. First up, uh, polls concluded. My next Let's Play after this one is going to be Transistor, which is a really beautiful game from Supergiant, which is a studio who specialise in gorgeously aesthetic experiences. They might be one of the best um, studios out there as far as artistry is concerned. Perfect blends of painterly visuals and gorgeous music. So yeah, the other thing is that I have now started streaming. Um, when this goes up, uh, I will have done a one-off Hard Space Shipbreaker stream, and then from the next instance onwards it will be working my way through Hollow Knight, which is a very beautiful game, which just from playing the beginning of it it's kind of dug its way deep into my heart already. I actually stopped playing it by myself because I felt I wanted to share my experience of playing it for the first time because it was too beautiful not to share. Uh, the game, not my experience. So yeah, um, streams will be regularly scheduled on Tuesday and Friday evening, starting at 6pm UK time. I might tweak the timing a little bit, but it should be those two days consistently. Additionally, there will be random streams of whatever I happen to be playing whenever I feel like it, which I will announce on Twitter and Tumblr. So uh, go follow me in those places if you want to see me live. Um, and that is all for now. So let's jump into the game. What are you thinking about? A murderer? Yeah? Yeah. Popes. Got a tip off about a meet at the New Eden Mall tomorrow. Gonna pay a visit. Shit, Faith. Why are you doing this? It's not your fight. Just, I don't know, lay low. <laughs> Everything's changed. The city's different now. I keep thinking of my folks. They thought this place was something worth protecting. Mom and Dad were friends with Pope. Organized protests, lobbied the mayor, took me and Kate on marches. But I never really understood why back then. What it meant. Merck said your mom died. She was killed during the downtown riots. Protest marches that went bad. That's rough. After that, we, uh, well, pretty much fell apart. Dad never forgave himself, and I, well, I left home soon after. Guess I never really forgave him either. That's when you met Merck? He caught me, breaking into his place. No kidding. He never said that. He offered to train me. Felt like a good way off the street, so I took it. Not much else going for me. What you're doing now, Faith, is the fastest way to get yourself killed. They got my sister involved, Cell, and I need to clear her name. I owe her that much. I'll survive. That's what we do. Survival is overrated. You need to live a little, too. Hey, you want to come with me tomorrow? Could use the help. Can't. Drake's got me on a job. Says I've been slacking. Look, I've got to go. It's fine. Someone's bound to start shooting at me soon. Get going. Faith. Take care. People tend to forget this, but this game actually has a really solid narrative. Its plot is kind of nonsensical to some extent. Oh fuck. <laughs> as I was saying, its plot is kind of nonsensical to some extent, but I mean, it holds together as a narrative, but um, what people forget is that it actually has really well realized characters. There's a surprising amount of emotional depth, and they are surprisingly well performed. Um, I was. 
section three and four. I always forget this myself, and what this game is remembered as is a, is as a really good like first person platformer. But every time I play it, I forget that I'm actually really invested in these characters and their emotional truths and their relationships to one another. Um, it's just neat because it's not something you really associate with it. And uh, we also start to see some examples of problems like this in this area. Um, the areas at this point in the game become somewhat more cluttered. They tend to have a bit more loose edges. And the problem with that is that um, Faith's edge-grabbing behaviour is not specific to specific objects. If you fall too close past any kind of physics-y, sticky outy ledge, you will stick to it. And uh, that can be really inconvenient in fast platforming sections when you catch onto the like lip of the edge of a um, air conditioning unit that you just thought you would fall straight past. Um, in the tighter industrial inner spaces, there's more of a risk of that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. The plot so far is fairly clear. Um, wow. Oh, Jesus. Oh, huh. Okay. Ah. So, um, yeah. I forgot to press the button, which meant that they uh, caught me in a small room and somehow failed to shoot me to death. So, good for me, I guess. Little snippets of further detail about this world are gathered through these um, LED screens in the uh, in all the lifts, much like the radios. They're just kind of something passive that you sort of don't really intend to um, imbibe intentionally, but that sort of lend a texture to the world. Although it does commit the sin of inventing some nations while also using real nations in other instances. It mentions the US, so presumably that's where the city is. Something else I've been meaning to talk about, which is that this game actually has a really, really strong sense of body. I talked about this a bit when talking about um, how characterful Faith's animations are and how embodied we are as Faith. But um, as a child and later a teenager and then later still an adult, um, to the roofs ahead. Looks like you're have a fight on your Uh, like not much physical ability, bad asthma, always, you know, always hating gym because I was always in physical pain, that kind of thing. Um, I basically found a degree of embodiment through this game. I never, never as a child understood the appeal of moving my body through space. I never understood sports or gymnastics or anything like that. Because for me it was physically painful and unpleasant, always. Um, but playing this game actually helped me understand what other people get out of it. Where that appeal comes from. How can I get the drop on this guy? Yes. Um, this is actually one of the most frustrating fights in the game. It's almost impossible to do elegantly and it's... Um, where's the other guy? <laughs> it's almost impossible to do elegantly, it's very difficult to bypass and it's difficult to fight. For a bunch of reasons basically boil down to the developers not quite understanding how to use their own uh, mechanics and systems to make a fun encounter. Um, I'm going to try and draw that guy out so I can get him. Anyway, so it sounds faintly ridiculous, like something a cartoon nerd might say to say that I discovered the reason people enjoy moving their bodies by playing a video game, but it's true. I never really understood the feel of the wind in my ears, the feel of my body swinging forcibly over the top of a of a wire fence, the kind of peak of equilibrium at the centre of that motion. Okay, he's stuck, he's not moving, so I will probably die here. Uh, no, I'm good, fantastic. So the main difficulty with this section is that uh, two guys almost always stay down here and they almost always stay next to each other. The problem with enemies who group up is that basically you can never fight two of them. Oh. Also if you wall run you always clip through that pipe, I don't know why. Um, yeah, so essentially if you try to bypass them you have to climb up this pipe which means they machine gun you and you die. If you try to fight them, the first guy is relatively easy to take out, however the subsequent two guys almost always are... Um, 
right next to each other, in which case they just, you know, gun butt you to death, or they are always within one another's sight lines. Which means that while fighting one, the other one will shoot you. Um, the key of this game is to always run away. Generally speaking, always avoid a fight. It in fact says this on loading screens and it's very much a part of the kind of theme of the game and it's what the mechanics lend themselves to. Also, I just want to point out the, in the only visual indicator of which way you should turn is that number, which instinctively makes you turn left. These little things are constant. I've been pointing them out all the way through. But that one in particular is going to be relevant for a reason I will highlight in a minute. Anyway, so... The um, remarkable thing about that fight is that it kind of shows how they've, in places, completely forgotten all their principles. There are a few fights in this game where you are essentially forced to fight, not only that, um, the advice you're always given is try to divide your opponent and take them on one at a time because you cannot fight two. Uh, in that area it's impossible. You have to fight two at some point because their pathing means the two of them almost always stay together. I don't think they're intentionally coded to be like that. I think it would be more accurate to call it an artifact of the way the pathfinding works and the way they're trying to path to you. The fact that they start right next to each other and the, the way that the objects in that area are arranged. So yeah, um, it's kind of just a, a questionable decision really. My personal belief, I can't remember if this is actually founded by anything the design team ever said, but my personal belief is that essentially um, the publisher was like, well this is a first person shooter, right? You gotta have combat in it, you gotta have some fights, right? Uh, so they included as many fights as they were told and made most made most of them skippable. I don't know, who's that over there? That looks like someone we recognise, right? In case you weren't following along, that is the person who assassinated Ropeburn at the end of the previous chapter. And uh, it is of course Ropeburn's rendezvous that we're heading towards today. Interesting, the plot thickens perhaps. So at this point all we still really know is there is some kind of thing called a Project Icarus which is going to cause problems and possibly destroy the runner subculture. Uh, the police are worried about, um, I guess, corporate police contracts moving in. Oh, this is fun. Um, if you pay attention here you'll notice that this game's attention to detail is astonishing. There are literally brush strokes on these paintings, but I don't know if this is like a normal map applied on top of a texture or what, but um, you can see that the, the brush strokes don't follow the strokes of the painting in any way, which means this is just like a texture that they've applied on top of all of the paintings, which means that what this actually looks like is not a painting with brush strokes, but a painting that has been very clumsily varnished. So the reason I mentioned the door numbers is because every time I'm playing this, whenever I play this mission, I run around here, I run around here, I instinctively turn left and run straight into a wall. Why? Because of this number here. It's the only indicator as to which way you should turn. Ignore the big green arrow because it doesn't usually work like that, it's just a squiggle. There's almost a sign pointing left, but no. Um, so yeah. There's also something slightly interesting in this elevator, which is that Callahan's campaign slogan is Finis Coronat Opus. This is a Latin phrase which translates as the ending crowns the work. This is more modernly phrased as the end justifies the means. So yeah, um, very much as we have all of the um, semiotic signifiers previously with Robert Pope as the guy who's going to make the city better. <laughs> They, uh, they're not entirely subtle about Callahan planning terrible things. Because I don't think anyone has ever said the end justifies the means and not been a terrible person. Now again, it is strange when they break their own rules of signalling. This is a huge open area. In fact, it's fascinating that so much computational power is developed processing this area when, generally speaking, you sprint through it in two seconds and never come back. But, um... The effect is undeniable. It really makes it clear where we are and kind of just reinforces the aesthetic design of this city overall. However, it very much looks like you're supposed to go in the front door of the mall. Nope, it's locked. All of these entrances around the edges look identical. It's quite hard to notice that one of them is open. 
Having noticed it, however, you just instinctively sprint up the runner vision blocks ahead of you. As far as I know, this is the only way in here, so um, it's just weird that they rely on you to kind of have to stop and figure it out. It's some of the zones in these in these levels are almost antithetical to the design principles of the game as a whole. Um, also, both of these vents lead to the same place, so it's not entirely clear why they bothered to include something that you could bypass like that. I could have dropped down that hole, or I could creep around the corner and drop down that hole. Doesn't really save me anything. There was a runner bag up here, but it's gone, so there is just a janitor picture. And um, trying to interpret these pictograms, I get the impression that the police came and took his rat away, which is honestly tragic if true. Um, it's honestly uh, such a petty cruelty, and yet somehow so meaningful. Rillburn was meant to be meeting his little friend in the atrium, right? Well, it should be just ahead of you. It's kind of hilarious to me that um, Merc is supposed to be there to sort of... Actually, there's a good example of this here as well. Damn, Shatter's gone wild. Get out of there. In theory, you can keep sprinting through there and go up the escalator, but uh, they always gun you down. You have to jump in this elevator. I, I think you have to jump in this elevator. I've never found another way to get past here. You also have to wait for them to stop shooting, because otherwise they will machine gun you as you jump out. Uh, but if you stay in there too long, they, they shoot it enough that it um, explodes and falls down, which I don't think elevators generally do. But yeah, um, so the game feels has the need to surprise you, the player, with startling ambushes and so on. Uh, but it also has the character of Merc, who is supposed to be telling you the best route and what to do, and, you know, give you your advice and so on as a runner. But... What that means in practice is that Merc is useless. He always warns you about things the second after they happen. It's really consistent, and right? it happens constantly throughout the game. Wall's got some support structures and maintenance areas at the top. There should be a way out up there. So it's interesting that the needs of um, the mechanics of the game kind of undermine its narrative. The narrative is that Merc is the clever guy with the floor plans who gives you the best options for every route. But in practice, he's always uh, more surprised than you are and only warns you about things after they happen. No, no, Merc, I don't think that Rokeburn set me up. I think that Rokeburn was murdered by the person that he was coming here to meet today. Um, anyway, I had something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it is. Also, I just heard a yell, so what I think happens sometimes here is that... The police were still running around in the level, they are still acting NPCs, they are still moving around according to their pathfinding, trying to find you. And I think occasionally they like occasionally they like try and squish into too small a spot and one of them will fall off a fall off a cliff, which is just kind of hilarious. Here again we see the lighting directing us. Dark light. You just head towards the light without really thinking about it. This bit's pretty rad. Well, it's rad if I don't screw it up. I've played, this uh, I've played this chapter about six times today. Every single time I have nailed that on the first try. Oh well. So, we're incredibly lucky here because... Oh. Well, that was perfect comic timing. So yeah. <laughs> you may be wondering why Merc is called Merc. For the longest time, I thought it was because his name was Mercenary, but um, his like code name is actually Mercury, which I really like. So yeah, that is the second time we will be using a gun for useful purpose. Oh, for fuck's sake! This is one of the more fr frustrating platforming sections in the game. Um, it doesn't have to be, and I usually nail it, but I seem to be having trouble this time. You don't technically need to take the gun, but if you don't, what you need to do is either smash it out with your foot, which leaves you uh, fully exposed to the heavy machine gun that Merc just warned you about, um, or if you're slightly cleverer, oof, this is the slowest I've got across here in a while. Um, so yeah, if you're slightly cleverer, what you do is um, you uh, run back and forth and then the machine gun guy shoots at you but hits the glass. 
Still, um, it's generally faster, I think, to take that guy's gun and use it to shoot out the glass. Regardless, that is just coming up at the end of this level. One last door and you're out of there. So yeah, while this feels like kind of an interstitial level with not a lot happening, just getting you from place to place to set up for the next narrative beat, it actually has uh, a few subtleties that, in retrospect, after you've finished the plot, make a lot of uh, sense that is not so clear now. Looks like my little friend is back. Think he's the assassin? I don't know, but I think I know someone who does. So yeah, that's going to be all for today. Don't forget to check out my first Hollow Knight stream, which will be this Friday, which is Friday the 6th? Yeah, the 6th of November. And yeah, I'll see you there. Bye! I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.